Welcome to a review of pendulums. What we want to do is I'm going to go ahead and start and uh, review the topic of pendulum periods. A pendulum period is the time it takes for a full cycle of the pendulum. So what we would do to find a period is we would, for instance, start a timer when it's at one location and stop the timer again when it's back to the same point in space. <clears throat> in this case, we get this number 2.88. And we define that number as the period of the pendulum. Now what I'd like to do here is talk a little bit about <clears throat> is the relationship between the period and different things that you can do with the pendulum. Now you should be familiar with this equation <clears throat> for T, period. T is like, it's, it's a period of time, so we give it this large T, is equal to 2 pi, which is just a multiplier. <clears throat> Uh, times the square root of the length of the pendulum divided by g or the gravitational constant wherever the pendulum is in action. And then uh, you should have noticed uh, in your previous study that this uh, pendulum period can be affected by things as we said the length uh, in this case right here shows you that if you make the pendulum longer because even though it's a square root, because it's on the top there, that whole number on the right side will be a larger number and the period will increase. In other words, it'll take longer to go back and forth. Notice, um, you'll notice that mass is no place to be found in this equation. So I can double the mass of my pendulum and it has no effect on the period. But uh, what you will notice that uh, and you may have thought about this from the perspective of trying to understand why changing the mass doesn't change the period of the pendulum, is if you think of this in terms of two masses, maybe one mass double the mass of another, and you're, both are released in a gravitational field, they fall with exactly the same acceleration. So one way to understand why mass is not in the equation is to understand that pendulums are, in a sense, falling due to the gravitational acceleration. But what that mean, implies is, is that we do need the gravitational acceleration in the equation, and that's why you see this value for g. You can see if you go to a different planet, let's say, um, let's say the moon, where you have a, a smaller value for the local acceleration for gravity, you'll have a smaller number on the bottom, and a smaller number on the bottom will increase everything on the right-hand side and increase the period. Another way to think of this is if you go to Jupiter and you have a large value of g, you've got a lot of gravitational acceleration, and your period, in that case, will get smaller. In other words, it'll go more quickly through each cycle. Those are some of the variables you have to deal with with uh, pendulum period. Now, one point uh, that's important in problem solving that you understand, because we're maybe not totally used to proportional reasoning using a square root, but let's say, for instance, I have a pendulum with a certain period, and I double the length of the um, string. The question is, how is that going to affect the period? Well, we said it's going to increase the period, but it's not going to double the period, because notice, by multiplying 2 times the length, what I've really multiplied by here, if I bring it out of the square root, is I've multiplied by square root of 2. So it's going to increase my period, in this case, by about 1.4. Similarly, if you have a problem that, let's say, doubles your value for the gravitational constant, it, you're not going to get half of the period because it's inside of the square root. But when you pull this out, it's going to be like a value of 1 over square root of 2 times the period that you had before. And so you do have to be familiar and careful with those little manipulations associated with proportional re reasoning for a square root. The next thing I'd like to review is forces acting on the mass for the uh, pendulum. I'm just going to go ahead and reset here. I have this in quarter time so that we can uh, follow through with these motions a little bit better. But what you'll notice is the green arrow is the velocity, showing that the velocity decreasing to zero as it gets to the top of the swing. At the very bottom, it has the greatest velocity, and the velocity is always tangent to the motion. But the yellow arrow shows the acceleration of the object. And this may be a little bit less than, um, uh, less than obvious. But you'll see at the greatest swing, it has an acceleration towards the center. But as it goes through the center, you'll notice that the acceleration vector points in a very different direction, points directly up. 
Now I'm going to go ahead and try and capture that here so we can uh, analyze that. Let's see if we get a good shot of it. There we go. Okay, so what we're looking at here is as this um, object is instantaneously going through the very bottom of its motion, you can see that the acceleration vector is pointing straight up, something like this. If we were to do a free body diagram for the object at this point, Let's see, for the free body diagram, we'd have the tension force acting up. We'd have mg acting down. And you notice because the acceleration vector is pointing straight up, um, this is an unbalanced situation. So forces have to be unbalanced in the vertical direction. We could write a Newton's Law equation for this relationship, summing the forces. We'd get something like this, T positive because it's pointing up minus mg pointing down is equal to ma. Now the key to remember here is this is you'll notice that this situation where you have the velocity vector pointing in one direction and the acceleration vector pointing perpendicular towards the center of motion suggests that we have a situation here that is actually a centripetal force problem. So this acceleration here is the same as the um, centripetal acceleration. What that means is this, we can substitute here for the acceleration uh, v squared over r, and now we get a force relationship for the pendulum at the very bottom of the swing. The last concept that I'd like to review for pendulums is the energy uh, for the pendulum, and which what I'm doing here now is I have these energy bar graphs over on the uh, side. What I'm going to do is pull this object off to the side, give it a full load of energy. You'll notice there that the energy is uh, showing on the graph as all potential energy, because notice it has no energy of motion, it's just sitting still. And uh, But I have, you'll notice, increased the height of the object. Compared to down here, I have this reference line down here. You can kind of see when I pull it up to here, I've pulled it a certain height above my initial reference line. Now I'll go ahead and release it from this point right here. Now I'm running this in very slow time, so you can kind of watch this transition. Um, but what I'm going to go ahead and do here is if I just go ahead and pause real quickly, really close to the bottom of the motion here, you'll see that all of the original potential energy that I had in the system has been converted into the green bars, which is kinetic energy. In other words, energy of motion. It's lost all of its height value, and uh, and now that height is be or that uh, energy has all been transformed into the energy of motion. If I continue the simulation, you can kind of see that these things trade off now as the object swings back and forth, trading off between uh, potential energy and kinetic energy. Now, what I'd like to do here is just kind of formulate this in a little bit different way. Energy bars are a good way to show this motion, but another way, there's another way that sometimes that this is shown graphically. So what I've constructed here is a graph of a different sort of graph than the bar graph is an energy graph where I'm graphing energy, total energy on the vertical axis, and then I'm graphing displacement from the equilibrium point in this case. So displacements right would be positive, left would be negative, and zero is the pendulum going through the center. Now if I do this for each of the energies, you'll notice you get a graph that looks a little something like this. So let's start with the gravitational potential energy. If uh, the tick mark is the maximum energy uh, in the system based on how far you pull it off to the side, you can see that the initial uh, energy at the farthest point to the right is going to be at a maximum for gravitational potential. It would look a little something like this. It has no kinetic energy and it has all potential energy. As the object begins to swing, it falls and it's continually losing its gravitational potential energy to the point where when it's at the bottom of the swing, in other words, zero displacement left or right from the equilibrium point, it has no gravitational potential energy left. And that gives us a graph that looks a little something like this, where the blue line represents the gravitational U sub G, gravitational potential energy for the object. 
Now I can do a graph similarly for the kinetic energy or the energy of motion for the object. If I were again to, to start at the right hand side, I would say that at the furthest extreme the object is momentarily at rest, so it has no kinetic energy. As it begins to swing, it starts trading that potential for kinetic energy, and so the kinetic energy starts to increase, something like this, to the point where it's going fastest right through the center of the motion or through the equilibrium point. And then I get a graph that looks like this, where this represents the kinetic energy for the object. And this is another way to represent the energy transformation as the object moves, in this case not through time, but through position, left and right. You can kind of see based on the graph that it's continually trading off gravitational and um, kinetic potential or kinetic energy. Now you should also notice this is an important point is uh, it's maybe not too, totally clear on my drawing here, but my original tick mark for my starting energy was somewhere around this point right here. And what you'll notice is that this total energy doesn't seem to change throughout this, this entire um, transformation between one energy or the other. In other words, if I were at any point, just pick up any random point here, if I were to add the amount of potential energy, gravitational potential, and then add that to the total kinetic energy at the point. If I add those two numbers, I always come up with the same value, which is my total energy, um, E total at any given time. And that doesn't change as long as there's no friction or um, anything else to be losing energy in the problem. All right, those are the three main ideas that I wanted to uh, review: the tension or the uh, period, the tension as you go, in other words, the forces on the object as it goes back and forth in its motion, and the energy. There's one last small topic, a little side topic that I want to talk about just really briefly here, and is this: is that you'll notice with the pendulum, as I drag it off to the side, I can think of this as displacement left and right. But you can also, also at the top, it is an angular displacement as well. And you can kind of see it looks a little something like this. This has a consequence for these problems that I just want to point out very quickly here. It looks a little something like this. If I take this angle at the top and mark it there, I can also designate my length of my pendulum here. You'll notice that I can actually um, use this setup right here to draw a triangle that looks like this. And as soon as you see that triangle, you know that uh, trig must be on its way. And that allows us to write a relationship for this portion uh, over here, since it's the adjacent side would be equal to L cosine theta. Now you might ask, why do we even care about this um, triangle associated with these pendulum problems? Well, if you take a look at the bottom uh, of my setup here. This little distance right here is going to be the amount that the object drops in height. So notice L, which is the full length or the full distance from the center to the very bottom of the swing, minus L cosine theta, which is that shorter segment, gives you the drop height and of course that this change in height is related to the change in the potential energy and the gain in kinetic energy. So this last little trick that I've shown you is that there's a little bit of trig associated with these problems sometimes that you have to use to be able to get this delta H if it's not given. Okay, hopefully that uh, kind of widespread uh, review helps you with the problems that I have assigned for homework. Thanks a lot for joining me.